Are we all happy? Can I begin? Yeah? You're all in the humanizing wisdom session, just in case you, you came in the wrong door and you want to leave now, that's all right. But first of all, thank you. Thank you for turning up because I know there's some delightful stuff on the agenda and you chose this one, so seriously, I, I do want to thank you. Um, my name is DK. I got a really varied background from local government, um, made it up to corporate, which is quite funny, uh, and then left and run a few companies myself. Uh, I'm from South Wales originally, hence the accent. I'm not putting this on. I can't get rid of it. Um, so that's me. Uh, yeah, I've got to. And, and for the last six or seven years, I've been training people uh, and talking about it at different conferences, all about social media and running a couple of companies to do with that and working all across the globe, working with wonderful people from the BBC right through to the Gates Foundation and the Pepsis and the Cokes, uh, the dark side of the force, and Ubisofts and, and, and everybody else, anybody who listen basically. But humanizing wisdom for me is something that I've just recently coined the phrase of, got into, uh, stuck a flag in, I don't know what to call it, but it's something that's been bothering me for a while that's just now found a voice. So that's what this presentation is all about. Some, a lot of my personal stories, uh, some just philosophies that I've got, some things that I've seen, some things that I've read, uh, and things that I just want to mash up and try to pull out and define what, so, what humanizing wisdom is all about. And that's where I'll start. I'll start at the beginning in terms of, right, how did this come about? Well, actually, it came about a couple of years ago. I bought a big book, and it is a huge book, called Wisdom by this guy. This is Andrew Zuckerman. Okay, he's a photographer, but he went around the world and he interviewed amazing people like Desmond Tutu, uh, Ravi Shankar over there, and, and everybody in between, you know, ex-presidents, musicians, and everybody who has something to offer to this world and done something great. And he put it all in a book and he just asked them, what is wisdom? You know, and it's just brilliant. It's portraits of these people and then their statements after it. And it's also a little film as well. Please get this out of the library. It's in the library as well. It's got a proper video that goes with it. An hour long, just viz interviews with these amazing people. And that, to me, where it started this wisdom um, journey in terms of exploring what wisdom is, because I think we got it wrong. I think as a, as a society, as a culture, we get wisdom very, very wrong. And I want to define it for you by using an amazing gentleman, Billy Honnelly, a fellow Celt, uh, there's no swear words in this one, surprisingly. So I want to play, like this is a, a clip it from that little video that I talked about, that wisdom video. And I think he sums up perfectly what we're going to explore today. Wisdom isn't an old guy on the top of a mountain with a loincloth and wasteland hair. Wisdom, to me, isn't an answer anyway. Wisdom is a question. It's like your mother saying, where have you been to this time of night? The question was the answer. She didn't want you to tell her. And I think that's where wisdom is. It's in the constant questioning of where you are. And when you stop wanting to know, you're dead. You're walking, but you're dead. Isn't that cool? You're walking, but you're dead. And there lies in the problem for me. It's like, well, if it is a question, what is the question? And that's different for everybody and everything and every organization and every, you know, um, culture and business. And really, I came up with my own kind of definition. So forgive me, it's really simplistic, okay? For me, um, it's about the positive, positive application of knowledge, wisdom is. That's, that's my kind of definition, the positive application of knowledge. And the positive is really important because you've got to do something good with wisdom rather than bad. Okay, the application is really important. I'll get into that, the action side of, of, uh, of what you know. And the knowledge is important because I think that's where the root of wisdom comes from. But people, again, get this wrong. Now, I'm going to share with you a really weird story. Anybody know who this is? This, to me, illustrates what's good and bad about wisdom, okay? In a sense, this is an awesome gentleman. Um, his name is Justin Knapp, with a K. And he is the first person to have a, a day named after him from Wikipedia. So Wikipedia decided that April the 20th was Justin Knapp Day from, from ever, so on and so forth. And I'm sure you'll celebrate it in your own way come April the 20th, because this is the first dude to edit Wikipedia a million times. One person edited Wikipedia a million times. And obviously, they bestowed this great honor on this fabulous-looking chap. Yeah? Now, 
there's the question is this wisdom in terms of if knowledge is the root of wisdom if someone can acquire and share that wisdom in so many ways or so many times is he a wise man hmm. I don't know but I think the model is wise that sharing of, of knowledge the Wikipedia how it's set up the fundamental basis is about capturing and sharing knowledge between each other because the wisdom of the crowd is where lies in the wisdom not that I know more than you it's between us we know more than anybody in a sense you know if we, if we times that by a million or or ten thousand or however many do edit Wikipedia on a daily basis so that to me is kind of the dichotomy that I find myself in and I want to apply it to organizations as well that's a very individual story um, like I say I've been dragging my bum around lots of conferences um, and I've been really lucky to speak at different different events and stuff and I've shown the next slide to a lot of people when talking about social media or digital technologies especially within schools if you work in schools or any institutional organization that have hierarchies and and systems and processes so this is about power okay I love this thing because you can rec replace businesses with schools okay or any other organizations or local government and and the power is usually where the knowledge resides right yeah people have a lot of knowledge that's where the power resides I know how to turn and use your Mac so therefore um, you're gonna come to me and I have the power because I have knowledge but again as an organization it's not very wise to give just ev just uh, allow people to have power in their own little silos because then there's no creativity in terms of cross crossing that power threshold or the power vacuums they used to call it in local government where literally the, the the discussion would stop at a certain point because people would have to sign off on the discussion to go further not even at the point of action we're still talking about stuff and people getting away yeah of those discussions and I think it is about power and and more importantly it's about culture and this is a delicious absolutely delicious quote that I came across a couple of months ago and I just think now it's defining the way I'm going forward in terms of my professional development but this is Peter Drucker don't know if you come across this guy he's like a business guru kind of really wicked and stuff he says and he said this culture eats strategy for lunch and I've been involved in so many businesses and organizations where they want a social media strategy or a digital strategy or communication strategy and and I've helped them don't get me wrong I've been there writing this stuff uh, and I've suddenly realized that's wrong because if you create a strategy with no cultural um, propping or scaffolding or framework then that's just owned by one person and the power and vacuum forms around that person because they wrote in there the knowledge base okay and this is what I have a big problem with because I've trained like thousands of people on social media and blogging and Twitter and everything in between and I know they get very excited at my sessions and I give them that knowledge and I give them those skills and the permissions to play but they have to go back into an organization that isn't set up for them to develop further and that's that culture rather than strategy idea here so the wisdom gets locked and lost or even it doesn't get enough air to breathe so we say because it stops at a point yeah because the strategy stops people from going further but the culture will enable you to accelerate I think if you form a culture so I'm going to talk a bit about culture now in terms of organizational culture where the wisdom lies because when I talk about culture and I've done this for the last couple of months talk about different organizations whether it be on Skype calls to friends or or when I'm paid to do this stuff I talk about culture and this happens which is my favorite gift on the planet I, I, I kid you not this is just wonderful look at that <laughs> it's just brilliant isn't it I'm sorry for that kid totally immortalized in this gift forever on and you find this on the web this is brilliant my favorite gift but there's something there that happens in organizations that I see people know what the problem is and it chases them around and then they put it down or they put it onto someone else when they know it's about them especially when you talk about hierarchies and structures uh, and stuff like that as <laughs> I could watch this every I'll move on very quickly because we're getting distracted but it's the fear that stops now let me give you a good positive against that uh, an example of someone doing amazing things um, this is Tony Shea 
He wrote a book on how to be happy, the guide to happiness. But he also is the, um, the CEO of Zappos. And I don't know if you're aware of Zappos as a company out there. A couple of knowledge there, brilliant. So Zappos, um, the company itself sells shoes online. That's what it does. But this is its uh, mission statement and vision and directives. This is its strategy. Okay, you can find this online. It has 10 points of how it drives um, itself forward in terms of its brand and its operations as well. Now, just quickly have a little glance at a couple of them. And I don't know about you, but that gets me excited to want to work for Tony Shea, you know? Or, or even if you want to go the other way, have a look at that and, and apply it to where you work today. Is there anything in there that even comes close to it? You know, there's so, emo there's so much emotion in that. There's so much uh, personal confidence, you know, trusting people to do their best uh, and to explore what that means. And literally, their strap line is something like delight the customers. Um, and that's just like straight away, it's a di we, don't, well, we happen to sell shoes, but our ethos is this. Now, to me, that is um, an illustration of an organization or a company out there that at its heart is very wise. And that's what I'm talking about, that humanizing aspect is so important to the wisdom. If we just hold up wisdom, we do get a lot of great quotes, good books, amazing people who have died, and then we miss out the application side. And the humanizing bit is why it is so important for me in this discussion. This is the perfect illustration of humanizing that inherent wisdom that we know organizations and companies should already have, which is this, yeah? And it's made live by writing it down and putting it out there to the world can see it's transparent. Again, not a lot of companies do that. Yeah. Wicked. Yeah, yeah, jump in, man. Would I yeah, jump in. I don't what care. Said, like, you think organization naturally have it, or is it, is it human naturally have it? Say that again. You know, you said, um, the wisdom that organizations naturally have, enhancing that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's, for me, it's that. Is it the wisdom that humans naturally Okay, so is it the organization creates the wisdom or is the humans in the organization yeah, yeah, have the, the wisdom? I think if, if you add, it's probably a balance there, but it's probably more weighted to the individuals. Like years ago, I wrote a blog post about um, like automating social media and how that's a bad thing and I got a huge number of comments and stuff. And one of my main points was that is that humans still have to automate, start the automation process. So at somewhere in the discussion, they thought it was okay to not be human in their use of reacting online, okay? Even though for me, humanization of brands is what social media does very well. It makes us all human again. And you don't have to train anybody to be human or nice because it's inherent in us. All you do is activate it, yeah? So I would wait, uh, put more weight on the humans in the organization having more wisdom than the wisdom itself because the humans can cr change the organization, yeah? Much quicker than the other way around. Hmm, maybe that's wrong, I don't know. But thank you. Cool. And um, coming back to Tony Shea and, and the humanizing aspect, I found this online. This is really awesome. How to kiss. Back in the 1930s, 40s, uh, there, there is stuff like this out there, you know, teaching people how to kiss. Um, but I think we are at that point where we have to train ourselves again. Maybe not train. That's a strong word. Give ourselves permission to be human again, to know that actually that's better than that. Now, come on. We know what is right and wrong. I'm not talking about kissing now. I'm using this as a metaphor, people. You know, move away um, from the kissing. But, yeah, I got you there. <laughs> um, but there's a metaphor here that we, we know what's right and wrong within organizational and in our own cultures. And if we're at the point where we're leading teams, then we have a great opportunity to activate that wisdom, like I said earlier on. That's just a great little kind of thing. Um, I want to show you another uh, brief little clip. Uh, it's more kind of a couple of minutes long, but I've shown this several times when I talk and I, and I can still come back to it as a perfect example of how a brand can humanize uh, itself. This is KLM, uh, which is the airline. You will all be probably aware of it, the Dutch airline. And a couple of years ago, they decided to try and reward their customers in a very human way. Their brief was simply that, how can we really reach out and, and touch people in a legitimate way, okay? So this is their um, video review, uh, for want of a better word, their advert for how they did this. Check this out, I really love this video. Armed with our social media toolkit, our little experiment began. First job, find a 
nine KLM passengers who had checked into their flight via one of KLM's four square locations or left a message through Twitter. Second job, search their social profiles, get to know them in a mm, discreet manner, to think of a personalized gift. Yeah. Nothing fancy, like a house or a sports car. Just small stuff, carry-on size stuff. Third job, hunt them down and deliver the gift. Fourth job, <laughs> repeat steps one and two until either success is achieved, boredom sets in, or blisters need to be treated. En een weekend dromen gaan doen. Het is misschien leuk als we haar zo'n 9 plus bandje geven. Nee, dat komt wel. Honderd procent zei je dat het er is. Dat geeft net een bericht, denk ik. Niet voor haar kaders. Goedemiddag. En je liet uh, ons weten via Twitter ja. dat je met ons reist vandaag. Ja. Dus we hebben een kleinigheidje voor je gekocht. Ja, en uh, nou, een hele fijne, uh, fijne weekend heb je geloof ik. Ja, weekend, weekend. Fijne weekend te wensen. En omdat je sportief bent, kun je daar je de afstand meten en uh, hoe lang je erover doet. Gelukkig, we hebben je gevonden. Hoi. Hoi. Ik ben je hebt uh, laten weten dat je met ons vliegt vandaag hoor. Ja, ja. ja dat klopt. Dus we willen je verrassen met iets, uh, nou, een, kleine, een kleine aardigheid. Dat is van je iPad gestuurd toch? Dus we hebben het een goed bon uh, voor je van 15 euro. Ah, ja. Even te downloaden. Dat is leuk, dankjewel. Ik kreeg een berichtje van uw buurman en dacht wat leuk, want hij zei, nou mijn buurvrouw is echt een voorbeeld, want het is nou, al een beetje leven. En ze krijgen dat zoveel met een klein cadeautje voor hem. En we hebben ervoor gezorgd dat u een stoel met extra beenruimte, ik kan hem niet comfort heet, dat we uh, op de hele of de terugweg hebben gemopt. Dus dan zit u wat, uh, dan zit u wat ruimer. Ik denk dat ik het zit gewoon niet zeker. Ja? Ja. After several weeks of handing out the cookies, a few things became apparent. In the age of social media, doing something that creates a real smile on somebody's face is much cooler than attaching a smiley face. But most importantly, it seemed that indeed an airline could use social media to both surprise and make a small difference to a passenger's day. And we're not just guessing that. We know. Because they told us and their friends, massively. Who thought that was creepy? People following <laughs> you. Running. Yeah, I'll crack her down and give her a gift. I think that's just wicked. Uh, I think it's just brilliant. Uh, brilliantly executed, great storytelling. Uh, the line at the end for me, it's better to create a smile on someone's face than to add a smiley face. Uh, for me, I've been saying that for so long to the, the clients that I've had around social media, but I think it goes deeper. It's not just a social media thing now. Uh, I think we have to work harder in our institutions and organizations to drive that emotion you know, and get to it uh, in a positive way again, the positive application of this stuff. Um, and I just think for um, an organization like KLM to just play around with these ideas of rewarding in this way is really bold and brave. I think, again, we have to give ourselves permission to do this. Or again, if you're a, you're a manager of some sort, give those under you uh, permission to play. Because play, play um, has so many positive roots in terms of, I, I used to say uh, for a long time, playing is learning by stealth. You know, and a lot of my training, training courses, if you've ever been on one, would be built around playing. You, you wouldn't know that you were learning because I hide the learning in the play. And I did that because I come from a youth work background and we asked to hide the learning because kids wouldn't turn up. We used to call things that we wanted to run different names. We used to trick them. It's really cool. But in a good way, in a positive way, you know? And I've brought that into training adults and adults like that too because we're all human again. We all like to push the envelope, push the buttons and have a play. You just need to be given permission as adults because we learn that, I don't know, socializing to failure, and as an organization that is so dangerous that we're not playing around with ideas and things, okay? So I'm gonna throw a few uh, quotes at you now to just uh, spark your brain a little bit. First from uh, Alan Watts, boom, big, big brain, big head, big, big love. Um, Alan Watts said, we've lost our sense of wonder, which I think we have, 
because we're all focused on the knowledge and information, information age and stuff like that, we just compile everything, but we're still not wondering what if, adding that question at the end. I like it, but I wonder mm -mm -mm, how we can use it. Not isn't that great. And uh, this is uh, Paula Poundstone, uh, an American, I think American, maybe Canadian, North American um, comedian, who said, the reasons why we ask kids what they want to be when they grow up is because we're looking for ideas. And as adults, I just think that's wonderful. And it is right to lose that sense of wonder in ourselves and not ask those big questions. We get lodged in organizationally and in our job roles, you know, um, that we need to break out. I think how to break out is, again, and I've talked about it, but I'm gonna now make a big point about the emotional side of doing stuff, okay? Not just innately, are we delighted by what we do, but how can what we do to put delight in others? And I think uh, to aid that a little bit, it's all about perception. It's about looking at things differently. Wisdom does unearth itself when you keep asking those questions, yeah? But the questions could be about perception. What if I looked at something different? It's a great provocation to start any type of discussion around developing products, services, ideas internally, whatever. And this, for me, is a perfect illustration of it. I found this in uh, Whitcalls. You know Whitcalls here, yeah? Um, which is like a, a stationery store, yeah? And I saw this poster, first of all, just propped up. And I went over, and this is true, I went over to turn it round because it was upside down. Right, but it wasn't actually, and I bought this afterwards. I just thought this is brilliant because you know New Zealand is where the UK usually would be, and and I just think it's really pretty, but I think it's really clever as well. How it forced me to stop, forced me to reflect, forced me to ask questions. Oh, I wonder why Britain is at the centre usually, probably because we colonised everywhere. You know, we were the first one with pens. I don't know, um, and we drew stuff uh, a lot, but just doing that. You know, switching things around, what if questions, switching your perception, I think really drives out the wisdom in an organization. And I talked about activating it before. These are the tools I think that we could use to activate that. I don't know, I'm just exploring this as a, an idea here, but I'm, I think I'm getting somewhere. Now flip that around. You can also go too far with switching perceptions, all right? Uh, I found this online very recently, literally last week. I think this is asking, a, a question too far. This is potty training your kids, okay? And out to potty train your kids is to create an iPad holder integrated into the potty. I think that's a question too far there, you know? Um, so there is a, it comes with a, a government health warning, all this stuff, I think, because you end up creating awful things like this. And I will say it is awful, because I don't think that's a way to train kids. Not that I'm a dad, but I just think that's wrong. You know, it's, it's going down a route you don't want to get off there. Um, quite literally, you don't want to get off, yeah. Um, ask a mother, ask a it probably worked, yeah, it probably worked. But they might be locked and they might be, uh, you know, cognitive behavior therapy right there, you know, association. And, uh, anyway, um, every time they use an iPad, it might get messy. Um, so failure, again, looking at that as not a failure because I'm sure they will sell a lot of them. I want to talk about a personal story that I had. Uh, or was involved with, which was a huge failure. We went, uh, my company back in uh, 2007, wow, yeah, went to Johannesburg, South Africa, to, to, to attend the media, uh, what was it, the Media and Children Fifth World Summit. So it was all about young people and the media, okay? It was an international fair, it had like five, uh, 1,000 kids, uh, 1,500 professionals, in inverted commas, in Johannesburg, it was wonderful. And we were there doing our digital journalist program. Uh, back in the day, I used to do these workshops, you know, pretty much every month. We're training kids to become digital journalists. Really simple publishing model. Get them to use cameras, video someone, how to video someone, you know, frame in, use the mic properly, the right questions. How to edit that down very quickly, put it on YouTube, and cross-post that onto a blog that we had going. So we aggregated. Really simple publishing model. Lots of digital literacy rolled in. Now, before we arrived, we, we knew the kids that we were going to have, which is really important when we're developing anything in terms of digital literacies. One of them had held a video camera before. Uh, they were from South Africa, half of them from like Johannesburg and Cape Town, from, so developed. And then other half from developing, like Ghana, Mozambique, uh, Burundi, places I can't point to still on a map, you know, but it's Africa. Um, it's there. Now, 
delightful, brilliant kids, fantastic. Uh, we had a UN interpreter as well in there at one stage because a couple of the girls down there from Mozambique can speak English. So we had a UN interpreter to speak uh, French, which I didn't know to them. Uh, who knew that? Uh, so that was just brilliant. What an experience. We had four days with the kids. We thought, brilliant. Okay, two days training showing them the kit, because only one of them had held a video camera before, so it was quite low. Some of them played on computers, but not many. So we thought two days training, and two days out in the field interviewing their peers, because that was the end result. We thought we got a few days, we can play around. And we failed, because our model didn't fit them. Half a day it took for them to train up. Only a half a day, because they had everything up. And, and we discovered from that the button theory, which drove all our trainings from then on forwards, which is you give something with a button on it to a young person, they'll press it to see what it does, no matter what their cultural heritage. And if you give the same thing to an adult, they'll ask you what it does before they press it. Now, that's really crucial to understand if you're training or professionally developing adults, because a lot of the stuff is online nowadays. So if you already fear clicking buttons, what is a mouse? What is everything online? You've got to click. It's a linear format. You've got to click things to go to the next thing. Straight away, if adults already are scared a little bit of clicking, you've got a problem, and you're going to fail. But it's also a reflection on this. It's not wise to design programs too deeply based on your perceptions of what the, the other people can and can't do. You know, I learned very quickly at that point is to be very open uh, with designing any courses, even adults, you know, go there with one and two and three steps, but no, you've got to go right up to 10 because someone might accelerate through that. And you're just going to be left sitting in a corner with some kid who's kind of really all over this stuff. You've got nothing for them to do. And it's the same in many of your schools, I'm sure, or your organizations where someone is accelerating and then suddenly they leave because they're not being pushed. Yeah, we are failing people and it's not very wise to limit them through our systems and our strategies and stuff like that. Now, the other stories I want to share with you are really weird now, okay? Because I talk about failure, and I'm going to share stories of success. This is a great book. If you've never read it, please go and, and download it and, or get it out of the library. It's called Rework, which is from some guys called 37 Signals. They're a software house online, okay? And they wrote this book about reimagining work and the work ethic and everything around it, okay? So they got chapters in there like uh, meetings are toxic. Stop having them. Stop having meetings, okay? Uh, planning is guessing. In other words, stop writing plans and strategies. Just go and do it, and then come back and say, how can we get better, okay? So really trying to reimagine work. Brilliant book, okay? So I took this, and sometimes I kick it old school, pen and paper, people, and I um, paraphrase. This is how I remember. I got a really short attention span, so I kind of paraphrased every chapter into things that I can take away, okay? And I put that up on my personal blog back then, it was called Nat Nat, don't ask me why, it's just a bit weird. And I put it up there and I called it the cheat sheet because you can go and download this, which is a PDF, because I basically took a photo of every one of my pages I took, put them into a PDF, a long PDF, and I made it available to download off my site. So this is like the cheat sheet for the book. And I call it cheat sheet, gotta get that right. Um, because back in school, when I was a kid, when we were doing like Shakespeare and stuff, people used to pass around cheat cheat sheets, okay, which is kind of, you know, um, quick step in the whole book, in a sense. Now you can buy legal versions, they're called study guides. Back then we didn't have them, we had literally our notes of like, no, you don't have to read that, that's all she meant, like, so, wow, great. So I put that up online, and a couple of people downloaded it, and I thought, that's cool. A week later, 10 days later, this guy tweeted out, Okay, you can see I took a screen grab of this guy's tweet. He said, rework cheat sheet and the link to go and, go and, uh, go and download it. This guy's called Jason Freed, not Freud, Jason Freed. Jason Freed is the author of Rework. The guy who wrote that book that I just paraphrased and made available for everybody to download for free. And he tweeted it, okay? Um, and what was fun is my, my server took a hammer in. Okay, after that, about 50,000 downloads straight away. But it didn't stop there, okay? Some guy called Rich Gould in America, I've never met him, probably never will, always give him a shout out, took my work, this is my work, he stole my work, and he remixed it. He put color on it, <laughs> because he thought it wasn't colorful enough. So it was a bit boring, that's all he did. And he uploaded this to a place called Scribed, which is like PDF hosting, like a YouTube, you put videos on, Scribed, you put PDFs on. Okay, made that available. And I was like, you stole my work. 
but that's cool. That's cool. Then, a couple of weeks later, another guy called Simmonson took that work and he remixed it and made it corporate. Okay, and he just tidied it all up. And he put that up on um, SlideShare, and people were downloading it. Now, I'll get to the point in a minute, after I share with you my second story, which is, this is my moleskin. I love moleskins. It's really expensive notebooks. Really shouldn't buy them. Uh, but I really like them. And I don't know if you can make out, but on my moleskin is a pen holder. Now, online, there's a huge community around moleskins. Don't know if you've ever been, or if you want to be the Italian way, moleskinas. That's apparently how you should say. Uh, but there's a huge community online. And then there's sub-communities of any, any communities. There's communities online to do with moleskinas, which is all about hacking them. How to make your moleskin better. Hacking them. Seriously. Weird. Okay, but freakier is there's a subset of the moleskin community about hacking is how to hack it to hold your pen. And I'm part of that community. Because my mum, who's awesome, made my pen holder for me. This is a moleskin pen holder. Only one in the world, because she designed it. And I thought, man, that's awesome. Can I like take photos of you making that pen? moleskin pen holder and then I'll put it up on my site and she said you're a freak why aren't you married yet like your brothers uh, but okay and this is my moleskin pen holder well it's my mum's moleskin pen holder pdf how to if you want to make a, a pen holder and it's just an elastic sewn in certain places and put on and you can hold your pens and she made a version two hold two pens she's working on a version three pen iphone okay it's getting into it now I just threw that up Okay, and it had, by the end of that year, that was 2009, by the end of that year, it had 1,000 downloads. People, and I'm serious, were sending me emails of their moleskin pen holders that they've made. And I was sharing it with my mum, and she was freaking out, but she could kind of get that this was something different going on here. Now, I'm shit, my mum is awesome. She's so craft-orientated, not crafty. Um, and it's brilliant. She just sews without looking and stuff like that. Proper Welsh man. Uh, and she makes stuff without even blinking. And I just think she's got inherently a huge amount of wisdom. And I'm already saying, put her stuff on Etsy and share it through other places like Coursera and all that things. She's like, oh, no, the web. So people might want to talk to me. And I'm like, yes, and that's amazing. I want to make it a superstar. But I uploaded this, and a thousand times it was downloaded by the end of, the, end of that year, which is kind of cool. 18 months later was when it really started. Lifehacker, if you've never been on it, is a huge site. It gets, it's one of those really popular sites, like a million people a week, you know, stupid. And my, most, my mum's moleskin pen holder was featured on the Japan, Japanese sorry, uh, version of the site first, and then they put it on the .com, the main bit of the site, okay? And bang, it was featured. And it was like, okay, that's a bit freaky, 18 months later. And my web server did, again, take a hit in on that day alone. And I still get emails from people going, <laughs> look at my moleskin pen holder. Thank you, mum. I'm like, OK, cool. And uh, if, you're, if you're really interested in the next iteration of moleskin pen holders, uh, if you go to uh, charity shops and buy old skull braces, gentleman braces, because there's all different patterns and they're elastic. And you can have all different pattern ones now. People email me this stuff, seriously, still. And it's just wicked. Now, to me, that's a perfect illustration of to succeed online, create by our app viral content, but I didn't go after that. I really didn't. I didn't have a strategic notion in my brain about sharing this content to get this amount of people to download it. All I was doing was just sharing transparently, being um, kind of the cool kid, just knowing some stuff, throwing it up out there and seeing where it goes. And other people determined its success, not me. And that's really crucial to understand, is your success as an organization even as a school, relies on other people. As a school, inherently, definitely, it's the kids that actually make the school. Yeah, because they can turn up and you could be the best teacher in the world, but if you're not getting to the kids, wow. Okay, because I'm saying that because I know there's a lot of teachers and organizations in education here. But apply that across the board in any institution, in any organization, in any business. You've got something going on there. Now, like I said, my, the power that lay here wasn't with me, the desire for other people to make the success is what actually drove it in the end. And that desire is something that we need to understand better if we are going after something. This is something called desire, desire paths. I don't know if you ever come across it. It's actually a phrase. You can look it up on the interwebs. You'll find a Wikipedia entry. I think it's brilliant. Found this out about 18 months ago. And probably for our whole lives, we've been doing this. Yeah? I don't know about you, but which way are you going to walk? 
Yeah? But it's got a bigger point here. And, and actually, uh, uh, park creators, I don't know what to call them, people who create parks in Scandinavia, design parks and put them in, like councils and stuff, actually apply this methodology. What they do, they stick in parks and they won't put any paths in. And they'll wait a season and they'll see where people are walking. Then they'll put paths in. Now we hear that and we go, <laughs> that's cute, that's cool, yeah, that's clever, that's wise. But we don't do that in our day-to-day -day lives, and especially when we're teaching or education. Yeah, there's a set path, and I know that's not down to many of the people in this room, it's set by high above and all that things, but also think about it wider when we develop our own strategies or our programs and stuff like that. The end game is what I'm interested in. And when I talked earlier on about changing my whole system of training kids after the Africa experience, one of the big things for me was not to define how kids get from A to B, but just to define B for them. Just say, look, this is what we want today. We want a digital story from you. And they go, what's that? Right, it could be video, it could be uh, images, it could be voice, it could be text on images, it could be anything. What do you want to do? Uh, I don't know. Well, you've got a phone in your pocket. Let's get it out. Let's have some fun. Yeah, and then apply the learning on top of it. A lot of people work the other way around. And in organizations and brands, good brands allow this to happen. A lot of content marketing going on out there. If you don't know that phrase, check it out, content marketing. Creating content and allowing other people to market through that, but it's associated. It's not saying this is Coke and we're brilliant. This is funding brilliant filmmakers, and it just so happens to be funded by Coke. The association game back then. So let me show you something really wicked now. I, this is one of my favorite TED Talks, but it's, every time I talk about it, people are going, nah, I'm seeing that one, which is great, okay? I'm gonna talk about designing for that kind of wisdom idea and activating it, and actually asking the right questions, really. This is what illustrates it perfectly. This is Prince, uh, what's his name? Joshua Prince Ramos. I'm not kidding, that's his name. That's why I gotta look down, because I always get it wrong. Joshua Prince Ramos. He's an architect and he designed, uh, and if you've been there, you'll know it, it's wonderful. The Seattle State Library. I was there a couple of years ago, it's just, it's, it's stupid. Actually, it's scary. Uh, this guy designed it. Now, what I love about this video, he talks about the process of designing the State Library, but actually wrestling with the, the librarians, not physically, but actually getting them to think differently and ask different questions. Because they went to him, obviously, with a, with a brief, design us a new library. But he went back and said, you got the wrong question. You don't want a library. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure we're librarians and we got a box and stuff. So this is his approach to coming back at someone. This is wicked. Check this out. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to sort of build up the Seattle Central Library in this way before you arrive in those five or six diagrams. And I truly mean this is the design process, as you'll see. With the library staff and the library board, we settled on two core positions. This is the first one. Uh, this is showing over the last 900 years the evolution of the book and other technologies. Um, this diagram was our sort of position piece about the book, and our position was books are technology, it's something people forget, but it's a form of technology that will have to share its dominance with any other form of truly potent technology or media. The second premise, and this was something that was very difficult for us to convince the librarians of at first, is that libraries since the inception of Carnegie Library tradition in America uh, had a second responsibility, and that was for social roles. Okay, now this I'll come back to later, but something actually, the librarians at first said, no, this isn't our mandate. Our mandate is um, media, in particular the book. That's a bit I'll stop at, because I'm going to show you a next bit now. And I want to just really iterate the point that they were coming back saying, no, we're librarians, we're into books. And he forced them into this in a good way. He used wisdom very much uh, and models just to illustrate. And that's what he's going to do in the next bit, is literally visually illustrate where they were going wrong and how they saw uh, and, and the perception that they had, he shifted it. This is beautiful. Accept this. What you're seeing here is actually their program on the left. That's as it was given to us in all of its clarity and glory. Um, our first operation was to redigest it or back to them, show it to them, and say, you know what, we haven't touched it, but only one third of your own program is dedicated to media and books. Two thirds of it is already dedicated. That's the white band below. The thing you say isn't important is already dedicated to social functions. So once we had presented it back to them, they agreed that this sort of core concept could work. We got the right to go back to first principles. That's the third diagram. We recombined everything. And then we started making new decisions. 
What you're seeing on the right is the design of the library, specifically in terms of square footage. On the left of that diagram here, you'll see a series of five platforms, sort of cones, collective programs, and on the right are more indeterminate spaces, things like reading rooms, whose evolution in 20, 30, 40 years we can't predict. So that literally was the design of the building. They signed it into, to the chagrin. We came back a week later and we pres presented them this. And that's the library. That's wonderful. Basically, the library, when you see it, it, it's covered, obviously. But that is the library. You'll still see the sections. It's got a breathable bookcase inside. The bookcase goes round and up, OK? And it breathes with how many books it goes into it. So there's more books in it. It breathes upwards and out and down, and then it breathes inward. It's kind of on a rolling scale. It's, it's just tremendous, OK? But you saw how he kind of had to wrestle with the first principles, the first kind of iterations of what they were coming back in terms of the brief. Again, I just apply this to so many clients that I've talked to in the past. They asked the wrong questions. And that's very actually arrogant to say they were asking the right questions for them. I just present them with different questions. When people ask me about social media or which platforms you should be on, I'm saying, well, what's your time capacity? What's your levels of digital literacy? Uh, what do you want to get out of it? How do you know what success looks like? Then we'll talk about platforms, OK? Because that's the wrong questions. Because I can train you how to be on Twitter, but if you're just posting your press releases on there, or just shouting by yourself, that's the wrong way to use this stuff. Okay? I just think it's great. Last couple of slides, and then uh, get into some stuff that you can do. This is um, a guy called Bill Mollison. He's credited with the, the quote of permaculture, him and his colleague. Um, comes back between him and the other guy, but he looks awesomer than the other guy, so I put up his picture. Permaculture is, I don't know if you're aware, it's, it's a closed system of farming. It's usually ascribed to agricultural farming and stuff in, in that area. But I'm trying to wrestle it away a little bit. I'm trying to play around with the idea of closed systems in terms of skills and activities and operations for organizations and companies. Like if you asked yourself internally, where is the waste? What do we spend most time doing? Uh, what just goes out and doesn't get, uh, just gets um, fulfilled with our own energy and it's waste again. How does other things come in and, and alleviate that? How can we close the loop on our systems to make it much better? I think that has got a lot of applications in a lot of organizations. And I don't know as a model if anybody's done it yet, but I'm certainly trying to get it and apply it to the wisdom questions. Okay, because I think wisdom needs to have a closed loop system where it feeds itself, it's ongoing. It's not going to be a couple of consultants coming into your organization having to play for a couple of weeks and then they leave and it kind of, you know, long, not even long tails out but just dwindles out, you know. This has to be a little shift, but you have to then put a framework around it where organizations and businesses can, can digest it. And if you talk about permaculture, in other words, it will feed itself. It doesn't lead a lot of input and, and investment. Maybe that's something uh, to entertain. I don't know, I haven't formed that question quite right, so apologies, but I think I want to pull at it and punch it and see what comes up. Maybe you guys can help it at the end of the day and say, that thing, have you thought about this? Because I certainly haven't got the, all the questions or the answers. Um, but one of the things I want to kind of leave you with, a couple of last slides now, is that provocation to cultivate the right things and what I mean by that, and again, I, I'm just leaning on the experience that I've had with real big organizations who run multi-million dollars and pounds companies right through to the theater on the corner, which is struggling financially, but they have amazing people. You know, you got, but one does very well, the other one doesn't, and vice versa, and how can we learn from that? But it's more about cultivating wonder talked about it earlier on, or cultivate asking questions, or curiosity if you want a better word for it. Okay? I don't think we do that well as people and as leaders in organizations. We don't ask people. I remember having a CEO once, and he was just brilliant, because I, I went with him with a problem or, or a question, and he just says, I haven't got a clue, but have some fun. Go and find out some, questions, some answers and come back, and let's see if we can work on it together. Brilliant, you know, empower people to be curious. To have that door open policy is great, but if you're not working with them to, to have their doors open in the mind, I mean, you know, you're not going to get me much places, you know, not going to get for far anyway. But it is a bit of a, a trust thing going off into the unseen. Um, 
And I want to cap this off, this talk off with a, another clip, a video clip. This is from uh, one of my favorite films, uh, one of my favorite books turned into a film, The Peaceful Warrior, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, which is the book, and then The Peaceful Warrior is the film. Um, great book, good film. Uh, so that's probably a better way to put it. Uh, but this is a scene where, and I got to set this up, basically the young guy, Dan, in it, the lead protagonist in it, uh, goes to a store late at night, uh, a, a petrol store, you know, a gas station, and he sees this old guy working there. And, I, and he buys some stuff, and he walks away, and this guy's standing outside, and he turns around and he sees the guy's on the roof, right, in that blink of an eye. Just that turn, bang, he's up there, how do you get up so Dan's a gymnast, and he's going, well, I know a little bit about you know, human physiology, what it's capable of. And this is him coming back the next night and challenging the guy to what happened, what he saw. You know, Check us out. How are we doing tonight? Look, you know, I'm trying to get my It's a cool film. Um, just for the characterization of, you know, uh, Socrates, as he's nicknamed throughout the film, which is, uh, what's the actor's name? No. Nick Nolte. He's always playing like gruff, hard people who just shouts a lot in this. It's the antithesis of what he's played. So straight away, it's hard to get your head around, but it's great. But the big lesson for me in that scene alone, which underpins the whole film, really, and I'm not spoiling it by saying that is a great film, is one of action, yeah? is applying, even though you fail, you might succeed. But it's the action, the, the, the ability to make and create is what separates us a lot of the time. Uh, and the, the, the big people in the world, the, the people you think have wisdom, are the ones who have done a lot, I think. You can, I think you can make a correlation between there. And this is a photo I took. This is my photo that I took. Um, and it was in a company that I was walking around, and someone had printed this out and stuck it on a wall. Probably didn't get permission. Don't need permission, by the way. And uh, it was literally a little paper that just said, make something awesome. This is Google headquarters, OK, in, in San, San Jose. And I was just wandering around. That is different. When your staff is challenging each other to make something awesome, you know the culture is right there. And there's so many books on how Google gets it right as a culture. I can attest to that. Wandering around, you can smell it in the air. The fact there's ball pits everywhere and pool tables and people doing their washing and drying and you get fed like, like nutters uh, there. Seriously, the food is amazing. The culture is right. The culture breeds action. I think if anything, that's where the wisdom lies in creating something that does something. People doing something. Just love that, that I found that. Um, so this is my last slide. It's the question. Um, so what now, what next, what was he on about? Um, I don't know, but I wanna ask you a question. But before I ask you a question, I wanna ask are there any questions because I wanna give you a little bit of homework to do now. Uh, or as I do when I used to work with kids, never give homework, give them missions. Apparently it goes down better. <laughs> Seriously, semantically, but hey, it works. For some reason it works. Never give kids homework, give them missions. Um, have you got any questions before I give you a question? Have I fried your brain? Life Hacker. Find it on the dot com. Lifehacker.com. One word. Great stuff. How to, you know, hack your gutters to feed your plants and stuff like that. Just really random DIY stuff, right through to personal development things. Right, so my question then, and we've got time, we've got another 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes to have a play around with this, and really this is what I wanted, to have a little bit of a workshop scenario. We've already got space and created is four, 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 two, 
You might want to join others or stay by yourself. It's up to you. We've already got little groups. I want you to uh, uh, have a little discussion, if that's cool. You're very intelligent people. You turn up here, just rock it, have, a, have fun with this question. So my question is, what are the big questions in your industry or sector or institution, whatever, which could identify and activate with them? What are, the, what are the questions you could ask? What are the big ones? Because you might find that there's some commonality. There must have been some really different ones because people are going to come at it from different angles here. And I really want you to chat between yourselves first and then we'll come back and share and see where that leads us. Is that cool? Is that all right to do, that one question? You might already have a, a few questions, but can we just chat amongst yourselves? You've got kind of five, just give it 10 minutes. So it's 2.40 now, uh, so to 2.50. Let's have a chat and let's expose that wisdom nerve. Cool. Go. Break. <laughs>